Welcome from Emerald Hill Skies. My name's Doug, and I'm happy to be your host tonight, but really, we are together in this um, as a team, and this is one of the times where you say that uh, we're happy that astronomy is no longer this solitary thing that's done out in the edges of a woods or a field somewhere, but instead, it's a team sport, and we're doing this together. Over here on my iPad, here at the side, I'm looking up the stream now that we've started it. And I think it's right here. I'm gonna just turn up the audio for just a second and make sure our audio is going. Yeah, this way I can watch what you guys are saying. So welcome, Asray, good to have you here from Arizona. Mike, welcome from Georgia. And Frank, great to have you back here from New York. You've been a great friend as I've tried to develop in this hobby and uh, you've really helped me along the way and so it's really kind of you to stop by. Uh, we're observing from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. We're using a Rasa 11, a Celestron Rasa 11. It's an 11 inch telescope. It's mounted on top of a PeerTech uh, height adjustable pier. And you can see that it's uh, set up there inside a PeerTech Telestation 2 observatory. The roof rolls off, and we've already been out there tonight and rolled off the roof. The scope stays fairly polar aligned, and uh, we've raised it up just like you see in this previously snapped uh, snapshot. So that's pretty much what it looks like right now outside there, except it's a little bit darker than what that horizon looks. And on top of the scope, we have this outrigger kind of set up on a equipment plate with a ZWO ASI 178, um, kind of a wide angle view camera. I think with the lens it has on it, it's somewhere around in the neighborhood of 150 uh, degrees wide. Uh, you can also see a couple little blue boxes. The one on top is a, is a power distribution box. And that power distribution box by Pegasus Astro is also very handy to tell us different kinds of things that are happening. Like right now it's telling us that the relative humidity out there is 66%, so pretty high relative humidity, and a temperature of 28.2 degrees, pretty low temperature. Uh, in fact, it just dropped to 28. <laughs> when I was setting up out there tonight, just even though it just took 10 minutes in the observatory, I was already pretty cold out there. You can also see another blue box, and that is a USB uh, controller uh, box, and that uh, takes the data from the camera and uh, kind of combines it together into one USB uh, cable and sends it down to this equipment rack at the base of the scope where it is transformed into fiber optic uh, signals and run across fiber optics into uh, the office where I'm now sitting in here in the one. Uh, thank the Lord. Um, we're using as our primary camera on the end of that Ross 11 a ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro. It's an APS-C size frame camera, so a pretty big uh, frame camera, and it's mounted on to an Octopi Astro camera interface connected there to that uh, Rasa 11 corrector plate, the glass corrector plate you see there where it's connected. And this Octopi Astro helps us get rid of some of the uh, tilt and helps us align the camera a little bit better, uh, helps us adjust for back focus a little bit better. So that's kind of the rig that we're using. And uh, again, my name is Doug. Uh, we're operating out of that uh, Telestation Observatory. Now these are live pictures that you can see here. The one over here is the scope aimed at the part of the sky that you see right here. It's uh, if you can kind of make it out of here, here's the south, the southern part of the sky, that's the meridian. And so this would be southeast. By the way, that building is where I'm sitting, right there in that corner office. And if this were a, a live picture of that building, you'd see a, a little light going on in that building. That's my office. So we're up here in the sky at just, you know, halfway to the zenith, maybe not quite halfway, I mean, the actual, uh, uh, altitude is something like uh, yeah, 30.8 degrees up. So 30.8 degrees up, 
and you can see we're aimed here at this part of the sky. By the way, all night long, this red rectangle will help you see roughly, more or less, the field of view of our Rasa 11. It's calculated so that it will uh, give you that field of view that the camera is seeing through the telescope. Now this is uh, Stellarium, it's our uh, planetarium software, and it's showing you a, a, a non-live view of this object, which is uh, uh, Secret Deep 10 on the James O'Meara list. And if you're familiar with the James O'Meara book, uh, The Secret Deep, you know that what he did is he put together a um, list of what he considered to be 110 objects that were kind of like uh, obscure. They were secret. And they were all deep sky objects. This one's a galaxy. And as you can see, it's NGC 1300. It's kind of a whirligig style galaxy, isn't it? It's got a bar across the middle and a very bright core, as you can see. Lots of uh, spiral arms throwing out lots of star forming regions out there. And uh, let's go to the live shot. So this is actually now the live shot through our Rasa 11. And it's been running for about 11 minutes while I've been getting the, um, the uh, live stream up and running. And you can see that it's uh, using 20 second exposures at 100 gain on that ASI 2600. And that's a live view of this uh, Whirligig galaxy that you can see while that's uh, compiling some additional uh, frames, we'll sort of adjust this black level a little bit. I think we can get a little better shot of the galaxy if we move these mids up just a little more. We're starting to see those star forming regions. Let me look over what's happening. Kevin, good to have you on board from Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome. Kevin's one of our Patreon supporters. And if you're interested in that, you can go to patreon.com slash Emerald Hill Skies. And uh, he's, in fact, I think he's at the highest level there. Thank you, Kevin. Larry Fraley. Larry's been one of our best super chat donors. He, uh, a couple of observations ago, he said, I'm gonna actually pledge the amount of money that matches the, the object number of the next object to go to. And I wish so much that the next object had been NGC 1300, but it was down in the 350s or so, which is still an amazing amount to throw into a super chat. If you're interested in that super chat, I hope you can find that beside your YouTube stream. And all of the money tonight from that super chat is going to Ukrainian refugees who are not only fighting for their lives in that conflict, but also fighting to stay warm tonight with uh, much of the country of Ukraine uh, thrown into blackness and no electricity, uh, fighting to stay just above freezing. Uh, Let's see who else we got here. John, good to have you on board from New Mexico. And Frank, um, I'm hearing you say that background music is too loud. I'm so glad that you told me that. Uh, see how that goes now. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, Ricky, good to have you on board from South Florida. All right, I'm going to wait for you guys to say whether that background music is better now. Uh, tell me if that should go up or down. Thanks so much. I'm going to look here in the book now uh, by Stephen James O'Meara. This is NGC 1300. It's in the constellation Eridanus or Eridanus. And I believe William Herschel didn't catch this one. This one escaped him. It was discovered by William Herschel's son though, John Herschel. And uh, this is supposedly one of the most perfect examples of a grand design barred spiral galaxy in all of the heavens. Frank is saying much better. Frank, let us know if we need to bump that up a little more or down a little more. Kevin, thank you so much as well. So let us know that's okay. Um, it says, J Stephen James O'Meara wrote that it would prove difficult from some suburban locations with poor horizons. It's best to pursue it in a very dark sky. Well, we're kind of uh, off on that for two reasons tonight. Number one, we have a lot of light pollution from the city of Louisville. We're in a Bortal 5 sky, so a lot of light pollution. But two, we have a 55% moon tonight. And it's uh, very bright, shining right in this part of the sky. If uh, we can go back over for a second <clears throat> to Stellarium 
and back off. Um, let's see. Go back over to Stellarium. There we go. And let's back off here. <clears throat> and you'll see the moon is right over here on the right. So there's the moon. And look how it's illuminating this part of the sky. Just, um, I don't know, uh, something like um, 50 degrees or, or so away from this object. So we have a couple of strikes against this. But I just want to point out that in spite of that, electronically assisted astronomy is coming through for us. What electronically assisted astronomy does, in case you're not familiar with the concept, is it relies on eight or ten things going on at once. One of the concepts is a very fast telescope. This telescope is a f2.2, so that helps us. It's a very fast focal ratio. Another thing that it does is it's snapping these pictures in 20 second intervals and stacking them kind of on top of each other, averaging out all the darks and averaging up all the lights. So we basically can see a lot more of this image and fine tune it. Now there is a lot of moonlight in this picture, but you can see we can even make out these star forming regions. We'll kind of zoom in a little bit closer on this. You'll see a little bit of the mosaic pattern but I think you can also see the structure and these star forming regions here. So Stephen James O'Meara was observing uh, live through his five inch refractor and this 11 inch uh, EAA setup, electronically assisted astronomy setup, I think is doing us a lot better uh, job than what Stephen James O'Meara found in his uh, experience. Dane, good to have you on from Chile, Minnesota. I don't know what the temperature is there. Looks like it's down to 27.9 out of the scope tonight, Dane. I'll be interested in hearing what your temperature is in Minnesota. It's um, this NGC 1300 is a giant extra galactic system with more than 150,000 light years across and 70 million light years distant. 70 million light years away. And <clears throat> probably what we should do is look at the um, the the view of this taken by the Hubble the Hubble Space Telescope before we're done here, but the core the core spiral spans about 3300 light years. That's that really bright blob in the middle. Um, and what happens is this gas in the bar gets funneled inwards and then spiraled outwards. And it makes those whirly gig uh, spirals. It's so fascinating how perfect this is. He felt like this would be difficult to detect under moderate amounts of light pollution because it has a very low surface brightness glow. But under a dark sky, he was in a perfectly dark sky with his modest telescope he could see it fairly well when you use averted vision. You know what that is. When you kind of look away from the object and kind of try to see it from your peripheral vision, that's a little bit better vision if you have to use a telescope live through the eyepiece. With EAA, you don't have to do that. You can look right at the galaxy. A tiny star-like nucleus he saw. And with us, it's a much brighter core hum. And he talks about one arm shooting off to the west end, the other arm from the east, a dim star trapped between the northwestern arm and the inner lens. Can you see it? That dim star is this one right here. Isn't that cool? Let me look over and see what you guys are saying here. Eight degrees, Dane. That's pretty cold in Minnesota. Well, we're going to snap a picture of this and we'll just say, save exactly a scene. This is such a beautiful barred spiral. I think we'll, we'll back off a little bit here. By the way, here's an object over here that looks like maybe a globular or a, a galaxy. Let's go back over to Stellarium and see. That's NGC 1297. It's another galaxy. And it's magnitude 15.16. So in our uh, EAA shot, this magnitude 
15 galaxies showing up really well. We could just spot it, couldn't we? Let's do a picture of this. And why don't we um, <clears throat> snap our picture of this like this. I'm gonna bring the blacks down just a hair so that a little more contrast on this. Yeah, that helped us to see that those star forming regions. Look at this, look at this uh, dust being thrown out here, this gas lane. Okay, I'm gonna use the, um, the screenshot utility I have and just snap this kind of a picture of this and give it a manual name of, um, Try to get back to the right place here. Desktop. And we're going to call it NGC 1300. Looks like I've imaged this before. NGC 1300. And this is, uh, oh, that's the one I just saved. <laughs> it's picking up the shot that I just saved. Let's see. Uh, it's uh, 21 minutes of integration, 64 frames. And this is on 2022, 1130, the last day of November. So I like these uh, shots here that we do with the, with the uh, little utility because we can bring those right in to our uh, observing software. Use Deep Sky Planner. And let's bring our little observing software palette over here and say, amazing that this galaxy was literally 70 million light years away and still quite visible after just three or four minutes of integration. Of course, 22 minutes did a much better job um, we could see the core, the bright core, as well as the bar flinging gas and star forming regions in whirly gig style spirals. Beautiful spectacle. And then we'll just say um, Omira, <clears throat> um, Omira claimed it was one of the best examples of a barred spiral in the entire night sky. Okay, there we go. And what that does is when we um, click OK on that and wrap up that observation. It also removes that object from our live list. So let's now go to our sequencer and say next target cycle. And let's go to our deep sky planner and uh, do a new run here. And while we're here in Eridanus, why don't we go to this galaxy which is at 31 degrees, it's NGC 1407. So what we do is we just right click this and show the chart and that'll queue it up in Stellarium. And then we'll also say slew to it and we'll show you the scope as it slews. Probably won't be a lot of adjustment. Uh, this is um, 1407, 1407. NGC 1407 and I think the mount has probably settled so let's go back to the screen here. What we're using here now is a sequence that um, <clears throat> kind of automatically takes care of some things. One of the things it does is it snaps a picture of the sky, compares it to its records of the sky and then it tries to determine if it's looking at the same thing that uh, the records say it should be. In our case, it was just 
four hundredths of a degree off. And so it's making that correction right now. You can probably see a little bit of that kind of what would you call that like smearing of the starlight. <clears throat> now it's waiting for the new um, pointing to settle. And by the way, it makes a record of that pointing model adjustment in its database so that it'll be more accurate with each successive successive um, slew. And then what it does, that's called a plate solve, by the way, that, that realignment that it did. Now what it starts to do is it starts live stacking. And by the way, Dane is saying, I bet some places you're viewing are a bit warmer than eight degrees. Yeah, the core of that galaxy was probably warmer than our sun, you know, 10,000 degrees or whatever. So you're exactly right. That's quite a mess there, isn't it? Let's uh, zoom in some, first of all. Another thing I've noticed is with this most recent version of SharpCap, we have to come over here to the display histogram and do a reset of the stretch every time with the display histogram. So maybe I'll incorporate that into our programming in this sequencer. The next thing we got to do is bring down our mids till um, the light pollution settles down a bit. But this looks like our galaxy here in the middle, we're at 100% zoom. This looks more like a, what would you call that? A, a lenticular glob. <laughs> we'll look this up in a second, see what Omira calls it. Footsteps for Jesus Christ Bride. Good to have you aboard. Pure Tech. Hello, Vito. Glad to have you aboard. Pure Tech, you'll be happy to know that your observatory is performing well. Your um, height adjustable uh, pier there is doing a good job uh, with holding up that Ioptron um, 70G, the CEM 70G mount there. That uh, Pure Tech. Um, Pier that you fashioned for us, kind of like hand manufactured for that there in, in your shop, is doing an amazing job. So thank you for uh, the great craftsmanship you gave on all that, the the observatory and the pier. Thanks for the great job you did. Uh, you uh, sent me a, a message I think just today at uh, the new uh, uh, roof rack movement motor that you were using and it was obvious that you had been working on how to limit that so great job on all your engineering there Vito you amaze us well let's learn something about this galaxy this is uh, secret deep 13 it's NGC 1407 so let's change our title NGC 14 1407 Secret Deep 13 and it's a um, still a galaxy in Eridanus 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 um, <clears throat> see it has Actually, William Herschel did discover this one. Very bright, round, bright nucleus. He didn't know quite what to call it. It's 53 million light years away. Fourteen hundred and fourteen oh seven. I wonder if this might be 1400. Let's do a, um, in fact, why don't we back off first? Let's back off to kind of a full frame and let's do our um, deep sky image annotation here. Yeah, so this is 1407 right here in the middle and here's 1400. So those are the two primary um, culprits that we're trying to view. Several others that are here, there's 1402. I don't think that made the secret deep list, nor did I see 0343, but they're in our frame. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and see what we can make of them. So here's 
Oh, there it is. 1402 is there, and there's IC 343. So those are starting to shape up. Why don't I start an observation of this and just make a note of the fact that we could see these. Uh, NGC 1407 was indeed a bright glob with a glow all around it. Uh, NGC 1400 was in the same frame as was NGC 1402 and IC0343. Just put those in parentheses since we're not really observing those there in our, our little um, frame. So this is 1400, that's the other one. And we are gonna look at that in just a second. Um, we can see it here at the same time. They look very similar. Omira says that they're two of the brightest and most central galaxies in the Eridanus A group of galaxies, the largest clump of island universes in the very patchy Eridanus cluster of galaxies. Lying about 53 million light years distant, the Eridanus A subcluster includes roughly 50 galaxies. Most are dwarf ellipticals and dwarf lenticulars. This is probably, I don't know if we, if he'll tell us which is which here. They represent an astrophysical puzzle. They're early type galaxies. They're only 12 arc minutes in apparent district apart, and they're not interacting. Their recessional velocities differ dramatically. NGC 1407, the one there on the lower, larger circle, is receding at 1776 kilometers per second, whereas NGC 1400, this one up here, is only moving away at 549 kilometers per second, about one third of the velocity of 1407. How could this be? Hmm. Uh, some people have studied this a lot. Andrew Gould of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And based on the data, they don't think that 1400 is a rogue galaxy. They think it's right in this cluster. But I don't think he explains why they're moving at different speeds. Some people think that one is newer than the other. Others think that NGC 1400 is now falling into the group. Others think that 1407 houses a huge supermassive black hole at its core with one billion solar masses. Hmm. Talks about 1400 being a little bit fainter than 1407. So remember these are live shots. I'm gonna get rid of the um, overlay here. These are live pictures. There's 1407 and here's 1400. This is live through our 11 inch. Let's go over to Stellarium and find these. So here's 1400 and I guess that's 1407 there in the middle, wouldn't you say? Yes, it is. So there's 1400, 1407. You notice that the angle is different. That's because our camera is turned at a different angle than Stellarium uh, <clears throat> used for its shot. So really, we're getting a pretty good view of these, aren't we? Pretty much like they are in... in um, 
Stellarium. Okay, let's, uh, that's nine minutes. Let's go ahead and do save as scene. We have our, our name correctly. Let's see, did we do our observation already for 1407? Do we have an observation on this yet? I don't think we did. So let's do that real quick. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, <clears throat> so let's say, um, Omira pointed out that 1407 is moving much more rapidly than 1400, pointing to the possibility that 1407 has a 1 billion solar mass supermassive black hole at the center of its core. Pretty cool. I'm just going to save this text to our clipboard and uh, I'm going to do the observation of 1400 at the same time. By the way, tonight's um, observing session is our 99th session. So that means uh, the very next time we observe, it'll be the 100th uh, session that you guys have been helping us observe and we're hoping that'll be tomorrow night let me just get an update on the weather it was looking like clouds were indeed sort of sneaking in on us nope it's still holding so we're still hoping to be back on live stream tomorrow night if god wills so <clears throat> hope to see you back if you can do two nights in a row tomorrow night we're going to try to go a little bit earlier Let's go to our next target. Um, I don't know what you guys want to do next. I guess, why don't we catch this other galaxy while we're here in, in galaxy, um, the galaxy part of the list. This is NGC 3079. So what we'll do is we'll... Um, 3079. We'll... Um, Show it on the chart, and then we'll slew to it. And a little bit of travel on the scope this time. And we'll change the title text. This is uh, Secret Deep 38, NGC 3079. And it's a galaxy in Ursa Major. Okay, let's go over to our... Um, oh wait, now that that's settled, let's start the plate solving there. Let's go over to... see. Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. The Phantom Frisbee Galaxy. How about that for a name? Let's see where we are in the sky. Okay, here's the north, the north uh, compass point, azimuth. Here's, uh, here's Polaris and the Little Dipper. So if, if the handle of the Little Dipper were a satellite dish, it would, it would be pointing directly at this galaxy, NGC 3079 in Ursa Major. You can see here is the handle of the Big Dipper, Ursa Major. Here's the bowl of the Big Dipper. And in this case, Stellarium is showing us the entire constellation of Ursa Major, um, which is, uh, I think, for us, the Great Bear, and for you guys over in uh, Britain, at least, it's the Plow, I think. Now, this... Uh, funny red line you see here is the more accurate guess of where our horizon is. And you can see our horizon is kind of high because of this tree here. So if we back off a little bit, here's the roll-off roof of the observatory in our uh, attempt at a photorealistic horizon. Here is our northeast uh, horizon here at Emerald Hill Skies. And you can see this tree is kind of growing up here. We keep the photorealistic horizon 
a little bit lower than the more accurate uh, pol polygonal, polygonal, not to be confused with polygam, it's not, it's not married to more than one spouse. It's polygonal, just a line horizon. We keep the tree below that so we can kind of see what's coming up over the horizon for us. And the line is much more accurate than the photo of the tree, by the way. So this is not very high over our um, horizon. And yet, let's see. Let's just see what altitude it is. It looks like it's about uh, 23 degrees. And uh, you know, let's go over to the live shot and see how that goes for us. Here's a live shot, and we're already live stacking. Let's bring our mids down. By the way, let's do our reset of this display histogram. Let's bring our dark. This is setting the dark threshold to about right there. Bring the mids up just a little bit. And now let's zoom in on this tiny galaxy. That's 100% of what our uh, APS-C size frame this ASI 2600 MC Pro can do for us. Let's do bring up the mids a little more and hopefully it'll bring this galaxy a little bit more out of the darkness. How are you guys doing there? Uh, are you able to see what we're seeing? By the way, Kevin, because of your gift to the Patreon, uh, the Patreon, you know, site, patreon.com slash Emerald Hill Skies, uh, we're we're going to send you the actual uh, high-res images of these objects tonight. Uh, we'll send those to you custom because of the, the level you are at Patreon. Thank you so much. Again, this uh, is two minutes of resolution. Now we'll zoom in digitally a little bit beyond the optical resolution. And let's also look this up in Stephen James O'Meara's book, this is Secret Deep 38. Stephen James O'Meara makes it easy for us to look these objects up because look how he put these giant uh, numbers up here at the top of the page. So we can just scroll over to 38 very quickly thanks to these giant numbers. Um, it is indeed the Phantom Frisbee Galaxy. It's a barred spiral. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1790. Always amazes me how this guy did this. Um, how did he discover all these with his what? I think he had a, I'm trying to remember, was his a, an eight, 80 inch, I think, and they say it's roughly equivalent to a, today's 12 inch. So about the same equivalent because his mirrors were not as um, brightly finished and they rusted very quickly. Anyway, NGC 3079 is a spectacular edge-on galaxy, 64 million light years distant. It lies about, it tells about the uh, location. In high-res pictures, it's an awesome site. Bright nucleus, we're starting to see the nucleus a little bit there. A lens-shaped maelstrom of galactic vapors. Some of his descriptions are so picturesque. A site that brings to mind the frenzied convulsion described by Edgar Allan Poe in his A Descent into the Maelstrom. Um, he quotes Edgar Allan Poe, Here the vast bed of the waters seamed and scarred into a thousand conflicting channels gyrating and gigantic and innumerable vortices and all whirling and plunging on the eastward with a rapidity with water never elsewhere assumes except in precipitous descents. The galaxy's central lens is surrounded by a seemingly warped disk, which on the whole makes NGC 3079 look like a phantom frisbee. It's an illusion created by the dark dust irregularly distributed throughout the galaxy. And he points out that 
he wasn't able to see much of it through his five inch refractor. He could just barely make out that one arm was longer. And we're starting to see that as well. Let's zoom in a little tighter here and rely on our digital zoom. Let's bring up our mids a little bit more. See, there you can see the core and one arm is a little bit longer, just like he says. This is five minutes of integration now. Dean says, eight degrees is really cold. Uh, Dane says, when are we gonna start selling hoodies? <laughs> I think you can get something from the Patreon site. I forget what clothing you can get. Anyways, Dean says it's 28 in South Michigan, and he thinks that's cold. Mike says, if it's edge on, how do we know it's barred? That's a great question, Mike. I guess the bar must be more obvious in higher res pictures. Hmm. There are lobes to this galaxy and radio telescopes show that the output is unique. Whirling around, being expelled. Bubble bursts, episodic. He says it might take you some time to find it, but with EAA and this this mount we have, it didn't take very long at all, did it? He says it's difficult to see even in dark skies. Narrow streak of faint, fairly faint light in his four inch. But in his five inch refractor, he could see it was a sliver of light. And if you used averted vision, the longer you looked at it, but don't stare too long, the galaxy appears. Two sharp needle-like protrusions on either side of a core. He doesn't say anything about that bar, Mike. Let's go to the Hubble view. It's at seven minutes, so we'll just quickly go to the Hubble view here. And we'll say uh, NGC 3079 wiki. There it is, and here it is. Wow, is that not beautiful or what? Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? I'm gonna put it here over our live telescope view, and that way if somebody tunes in late, they'll think that this is our view. So this is our view through our 11-inch Rasa tonight. No, not really. Wow. Look at those star-forming regions. Imagine being able to see that live. This thing is on fire, isn't it? Okay, I just have to admit, the Hubble view is better than our 11 inch. <clears throat> I don't know, uh, Mike, how we can tell it's barred, other than somebody did maybe some really good radio astronomy with the lobes, I don't know. Otherwise, back to the real view. <laughs> That's our real live view with the uh, Ross 11. Let's dial it up as best we can before the whole image starts to wash out with moonlight. That's actually not bad. There, we're starting to get our moonlight threshold. Let's go down below that moonlight again. Get rid of the light pollution in the moonlight. I bet this is mostly light pollution because this is the northeast sky wouldn't be quite as much light pollution, or it wouldn't be quite as much moonlight here. But you know, for 10 minutes of integration, and that Hubble view was probably 20 hours of integration, this is not a terrible image, is it? 
Okay, so we'll save this as seen at 10 minutes of integration. I think we're going to do one of these uh, screenshots here. Let's get rid of those mosaics, about like that maybe. This is interesting, these little, these little double looking stars over there. So let's get those in the frame. And so we'll just now um, call up our little screenshot utility and do something like this. And this is NGC 3079. This is, let me get back to the desktop sharp capture captures. NGC 3079, 3079, uh, with uh, 11 minutes in 33 subframes on 2022 1130. Fascinating. Okay, let's go um, to our next target cycle and um, That's right here, it was 64 million, I think. 64 million, <clears throat> 64 million light years away. This barred spiral edge on beauty is nicknamed the, uh, what was it called, Frisbee? Phantom Frisbee. Phantom Frisbee. The Hubble view was spectacular. All right. <clears throat> now, at 18 degrees, there is a planetary nebula here. Let's um, refresh this. Yeah, that planetary nebula is actually up a little bit. So let's let it keep rising. Let's go to this open cluster. It's NGC 1750. NGC 1750. NGC 1750. It's secret deep 17 and it's a, an open cluster in Taurus the bull uh, the screenshot utility is called, um, what is it called? Um, what is the name of that? Screenshot utility. Hmm. Well, let's just call it up so we can see it. It's um, ear. Oh, that's earfun view. That's not the actual earfun view. Is what we use to adjust the the picture, but what is the actual screenshot utility? Share X, S H A R E X is the one we use. And I do like it, but I like the um, ear fine view better 
for actual editing of the picture. Share X. I'm glad you asked that. Okay, so here we are. This is already a good view of that cluster. I don't think we're going to have to live stack this at all uh, to speak of. By the way, let's do that reset up here. And we'll bring this up just a little bit. Boy, this is a rich star area, so it's kind of hard to detect where the cluster starts and where it ends. No, Azrae, I wish there was a screenshot utility in SharpCap, uh, but the only snap, like quick capture is up here in the upper left. And uh, unfortunately, it does not let you uh, crop in on the picture, does it? It's just saving a snapshot of the entire frame, and that's kind of what you were noticing, right? So I use this Share X to, to screenshot just a particular cropped section of the screen, and it just simply saves having to crop later. That's all it's doing. Secret Deep 17 is an open cluster in Taurus. William Herschel discovered it. Um, there are a number of star clusters here in Taurus, including Pleiades. But this one is NGC 1750. It's about um, 4. Point, it's a 4 million year young complex, a mass of about 6,500 suns, about 570 light years away. Let's back off of this. Thank you for asking, Azra. I'm glad you did. Uh, let's back off of this till we get back to the full view. And let's um, do a deep sky image annotation. 7558 is off of our frame up here, sadly. But these are going to be quick. This is 7550 here. We're going to have to well, actually, we could realign because we really didn't need to stack much, did we? Let's do this. Let's stop live stacking. And let's go over to where we are in, in Stellarium. You can see we're, we're high up in the sky now in the southeast portion of the sky. Pretty high up at uh, 62 degrees. By the way, there's Mars, and there's 1750, and here's 1746, right beside. And there's 1758, so that wasn't marked. So we should be able to make out both of these, 1750 and 1758, very close to one another in the frame. So let's get our let's get our bearings here. Can you see this four star parallelogram with a bright star in the middle and it's got like two dots down here and then the let's go back to our live view now. There are the two dots and there's the parallelogram. So in Stellarium, whoops, that's the Hubble view. <laughs> in Stellarium if we think about these two stars being the feet of something, and these are the shoulders, and the guy has his arms up in the air, this would be about the navel, and this is the guy's belly. So let's find the two feet and then the two shoulders. There I go again. Um, the two feet are right here, the two shoulders. There's that bright star. Maybe that one right there, or this one maybe. So 
So 1750, and this idea of two shoulders, 1750 is around about the chin. Gingerbread man with an antenna. I like it, Azrae. That's what we're gonna call it. Let's back off here. So there are the, oh, here are the two feet, here are the two shoulders. So 1750 should be right there. And this is supposed to be an open cluster. Maybe that's just it. The live stack was looking better, wasn't it? A lot dimmer open cluster than we're used to viewing. Oh yeah. So here's the, here are the two feet, and here are the, here are the, here are the two feet. So 1750 is here, and 1758 is here. Neither of those are listed in the deep sky image annotation. Oh, they are, look, but they're off. Let's do a, um, a plate solve without Resyncing. So we're just plate solving only. By the way, there is a very nice shot of a photobombing airplane. <laughs> I mean, it's just a beautiful shot. I'm so glad. We might be able to tell what model airplane this is by that, by that streak. I do have um, Sigma clipping turned on, but my theory is that particular photobombing would probably take 30 minutes to disappear, even with Sigma clipping on. Okay, now we've succeeded. Now let's plate solve, I mean, let's uh, deep sky image annotate again. This is much more reliable now. So here we go. Here is 1750. And there's 7058, exactly as we assumed. And then 7046, here we get as kind of a, a freebie. So let's first of all do the observation of 1750, which is secret deep 17. This cluster Uh, lies 2,000 light years away. And is somewhat scattered. Lies 2,050 light years distant. And is somewhat scattered. And then 1758 also a part of the same family of clusters. NGC 1758, which is secret deep 18, um, also lies, oh, 2,480. Lies 2,480 
light years distant. So that's down here, and I think we can take the deep sky image annotation off now. Look how this one is more compressed than this one up here. This one up here, you can barely tell it's a cluster hum. More compressed than its neighbor NGC 1780. Uh, Asray felt that the asterism surrounding these two clusters looked like a gingerbread man with an antenna. Ah. So that's NGC 1758. Saving a scene. I think your um, your new asterism name might catch on, Azray. I think Omira might put this in his next book. All right. Well, we run our um, we run our sort in our deep sky planner and. Here's an open cluster in Auriga that's at 87 degrees height. It's SD30, NGC 2281. SD. An open cluster in Auriga. Let's uh, bounce over to look at this NGC 2281. Wow, I just love it that um, in Stellarium now we never have to. Um, <clears throat> look up the objects because Deep Sky Planner cues them up for us automatically. Just to see what part of the sky we're in, we're back in the northeast part now. Here's east and here's north and up about 87 degrees. It's nicknamed the Broken Heart Cluster. Well, I'm eager to see why it's called the Broken Heart Cluster. Anybody able to make out a broken heart there? Is it that it's this large? Way out here? Maybe, huh? Broken Heart Cluster. Reset the display histogram. There's the live shot. Anybody see a broken heart there? Mike says he sees it. Mike, we need you to point this out for us, brother, because... Oh, right here, right? So here's the open V of the heart, right? It comes up, comes around there, comes up, comes around there. Wow, I wish we could annotate on the screen through some kind of a pencil. Azray, does Sharp Cap let us do that? I don't think so. 
that would be a fun thing to be able to do, wouldn't it? If we could connect these dots and then with a push of the button, get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> Mike is thinking it's more like a butterfly. I agree. That's just 100 seconds, but it's plenty for us to make out this cluster, huh? This is NGC 2281. This broken heart cluster actually looks more like a butterfly, at least to Mike. This is NGC 30. Azrae wasn't sure if there was a way to mark on the screen in sharp cap or not. Dean says, I see the roundest shape, but not a broken heart. Uh, discovered by William Herschel. It's a very pretty and bright, open. And he tells how to locate it. Cyclone alley <laughs> because of the star Psi Auriga. Omira says you have to have dark skies to see this. 300 million years old. 300 million years old. Tell us how to find it. Looks like a tortured stellar system. One that's being stretched on the rack. Million years old, 1800 light years distant. It's 1800 light years distant, 300 million years old. Well, it's beautiful, huh? Five minutes. It's fifteen subframes. Twenty twenty two eleven thirty. I should be writing on here cropped. Because that's basically what this is gonna look like. Uh, Dean says maybe a ladybug, laugh out loud. Mike says, I wish we could control your screen and show what we see. <laughs> I do too, Mike. That would be fun. Well, anyway, I think you get the idea. Let's go to the next image. Uh, oh, wait, were we able to see the next image here? No, I don't think so. 23.6. No, I don't think so. so. Let's go to the next target here and let's rerun. Oh, a planetary nebula is in the now. Let's go there. It's uh, NGC 2371. So we'll show chart 
and slew to NGC 2371. 2371, Secret Deep 36, 2371, a planetary nebula in Gemini. Sure can't see any planetary nebula there, can you? We'll see how close the um, alignment of the mount was. Sure, it'll be a little bit off. It's plate solving now. This plate solving is kind of a ninja miraculous deal, isn't it? According to those points of light, it found that the scope is off 0.13 degrees. So. 13 hundredths of a degree, not very much. 13 hundredths of a degree off. But because it's wanting to be precise, it's now moving to compensate for the fact that it was 13 hundredths of a degree off. And next time it'll be even more accurate. We wait until the mount settles and then it uh, automatically starts live stacking in the new location. And this is Secret Deep 36. NGC 2371. NGC 2371, a planetary nebula. This is where we have to um, Reset that display histogram. Oh, I think I'm seeing it. And Gemini. Showed up after just 20 seconds of exposure. Stu, you're back. <laughs> Good to have you here, Stu. We need your help looking up these objects. We're working on NGC 2371. And let's zoom in. Wow, you can definitely see the lobes, can't you? And look at that central star. I love this. Now, it's not really very huge. That's at 200%. In other words, it's gone past the optical zoom and 100% into the digital zoom. But look how clear it is to see the poles of this planetary nebula. You guys know by now because you're all regulars. You're the usual suspects. But in case someone is watching this and they haven't checked in, or in case you're watching the recorded version, a planetary nebula happens when that star in the middle lost so much of its material, its material that it could no longer support with its current level of mass the gravitational attraction to hold in all of the outer layers of gas that it used to hold in. So at this point, it breathes this kind of dying breath, you know? And when it does that, it sends out an ejection of material in all directions. But as it's traveling, the gravity of the central star kicks back in because now it's ejected all of that outer shell. And the gravity chokes the star down to a smaller star sometimes so small that we would call it a white dwarf. As a white dwarf, it starts firing back up again. And it might not have the 
magnitude that it did before. It might not have the power that it did before, but it's bright enough to illuminate those gases that it's sent off at high speeds. And another thing, the polarity is strong enough to kind of gather up those ga gases as it ionizes them. They become electrically charged. So it gathers them up in a polarity like the shavings of an iron magnet that's being shaped by the iron, uh, by, the, by the polarity of the magnet, the north and the south pole, and the power of that magnet shaping the iron shavings, this center star, central star, is shaping the ionization of that gas so that it lights it up like a north and a south pole of that star. Isn't that amazing? And sometimes this um, ejection happens a couple of times before the star actually dies. So sometimes you get um, different layers of that outer shell making a couple of different layers of light. This one has a darker green here and a lighter green there. And look, way out here at the edges, we're starting to see some other shell material that probably was cast out much earlier. And you're observing this after just four minutes of integration on an 11-inch telescope on a very moonlit night, 50-some percent of moonlight in Bortle 5 light-polluted skies through electronically-assisted astronomy with an 11-inch, granted, focal ratio, f.2.2, f2.2 scope. But look how we're seeing. I mean, we know for sure there's a shell that's out here at the very edge that I can tell you you would never see visually. Let's go look at the... Um, Hubble view of this. This is NGC 2371. NGC 2371 wiki. Wow. Look at that. Now I'm curious about what this other object was. Ah, this is our object. See what we're seeing? I mean, we could see these poles, but we could also see this material with our live observation without having the Hubble. So it's really fun, isn't it, to be able to do. There's the, um, the Stellarium view. And sure enough, we can see these outer layers. Now let's go back to the live view. This shows how you could do real astronomy with an 11-inch scope. Uh, Stu says it's 4,400 light years away. Let me bring up the observation. 4,400 light years away. <clears throat> huh, visually it appears like it could be two separate objects. Therefore, two entries were given to the planetary nebula. So it may be referred to as NGC 2371 or NGC 2372 or variations on this name. Yeah, Azrae, I agree. It looks like M27 kind of. Mr. Another, good morning. Need some coffee, 5.50 a.m. You haven't been up all night, I hope. You probably just got up, I hope, Mr. Another, because if I remember right, you're like in the Netherlands or something, right? Dean says, yes, coffee. Um, we're looking at uh, NGC 2371. Mike says the NGC number is, oh, you're right. Thank you. NG3-2371, we'll get that in shape. Thank you, Mike, for catching that. Germany, not, uh, not Netherlands, Germany. Thank you, Mr. Another. Yeah, I hope you haven't been up all night. I hope you just got up and somehow when you just got up, you thought you would tune in. 
We're glad you're here, Mr. Another. We're looking at NGC 2371, and it's also sometimes known as NG3 2371-2. That's NGC 2371, but it goes under different names. In Stellarium, it's using the name Twenty-three seventy-one. Yeah, not quite midnight, but still need coffee. <laughs> um, even before we checked out the beautiful Hubble version, our eleven-inch Rasa could make out. A, see, a pair of pole-like lobes that were brighter and closer to the central star. What would you call that shape? Kind of like a capsule. with um, <clears throat> a center LED <coughs> light dot. But after <coughs> five minutes, we could also see, <coughs> excuse me, we could also see a dimmer, fainter pair of lobes at a strange right angle to the poles. Stu says, check out the Hubble photo. So that wasn't the Hubble photo? Uh, let's see. NGC 2371. Hubble. Oh, yeah. That's just really strange. The Hubble photo didn't show the whole picture of these outer lobes, but we can definitely see the outer lobe on one side. But it is magical, mystical, bluish green, isn't it? We can make out the green. See if we can bring that up a little bit. Too much mosaic there. Pixelation. That is so strange. Let's look and see what Omira says about this 36. The Double Bubble Nebula. Oh, that's a great name. Why didn't I think of that? Nicknamed the Double Bubble Nebula. Mr. Another, yes, just got up. Didn't have to, but wanted to see you live. Mr. Another, you are incredible. You're the best sport ever. Check that one, not that one. Oh, not that one either. There must be another one. Um, it's a dim, low surface brightness planetary nebula. He tells where to find it. It was Herschel who thought it was two objects. Unknown to Herschel, these parts belong to a single nebula, one he did not recognize as a planetary because, simply put, when seen together, the entire form resembles a dumbbell or a butterfly more than a circular planet like Uranus. By 1872, Eber Curtis had recognized, Heber Curtis had recognized that it was 
a planetary nebula. Symmetry. The outer wings are quite extensive. It means that the nebula's true extent is three light years across. This planetary is a whopping three light years across when we count the outer bubble. The faint star is only 14.8. Boy, it looks brighter than 14.8 in this Rasa on EAA, doesn't it? It says it's beyond the realm of moderate sized backyard telescopes. Well, gang, with EAA, we can actually go beyond a backyard telescope. Uh, <clears throat> this central star is a non-radial pulsator. Only 16 of these are known. Has distinct spectral lines. So I bet since it's non-linear, that's why there are two different lobes at right angles. Stu, he's talking about your, your Hubble view. The prominent bright clouds and spots in the two central lobes. Relatively cool and dense knots of gas might be jets of material ejected from the star along its rotational axis. Ah, that explains it. So these inner lobes are not the poles. They are perhaps jettisoned out as it's rotating. Or it might be evidence of a second star orbiting the visible central star so they don't know. We don't know for sure. We don't know why it's like this, the double bubble. You must resolve the nebula into two bright patches. If you have a large amateur instrument, try looking for the exterior wings. Woohoo! I could not see them in my five inch, uh, and that's a five inch refractor. I have not yet detected the planetary central star. Wow. I'm sorry, I just tapped on the mic. Uh, I bet that was a big pop. Uh, only with EAA and an 11 inch Rasa could you see that central star. Also, these guys doing these observations see a slightly brighter lobe on one side, having what appears to be a stellar nucleus. Can you make that out right here? And Omira wonders if that's the jet that's jetting out from this star. How interesting is this, right? I love this. Most remarkable are the prominent bright clouds. Um, part of this is by this jet that's being emitted. So um, we could we could easily see that one of the rotational lobes, the inner clouds, had a very bright spot. Maybe that's a jet that has been detected by professionals. Yay.
Oh, I love this. The double bubble. NGC 2371. NGC 2371. Saving this cropped version. NGC 2371 at C 17 minutes and change 54 frames on 2022 11.30 uh, cropped. That's so cool, isn't it? This is one of the most fun. Yeah, Dean says it's an awesome image. Mike wants to know how old it is. Boy. I don't know if Omira says I don't think he does. Let's go out to here. That's very bright on your eyes, I apologize. It's probably just burning your eyes now, having looked at all these dark. It's 4,500 light years away. Can we just say NGC 2371 age? And will somebody tell us? How old? Maybe we don't know. I'm not seeing it, Stu. Did you find it or you had to go to dinner? I'm not finding how old it is. It's interesting that sometimes it's called NGC 2371-2 because Herschel gave it two numbers. Fascinating, right? Well, it's 1203. You guys have been with us for quite some time. We're lucky to see it. It may dissipate quickly. You're right. Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad we got to see the double bubble. You're so lucky having clear skies. Here it's cloudy since two weeks, and it won't change for the next two weeks. I guess because I got a new mount for my EAA setup. <laughs> Which mount did you get, Mr. Nether? Uh, we're going to let you guys vote now. We probably have time to do three more objects, maybe just two. We have time to do two more objects. We can do an open cluster, a diffuse nebula, another planetary nebula, or a galaxy. Which would you prefer? You can vote. Again, that was an open cluster, a diffuse nebula. That would be like a cloud shape. We haven't seen one of those, huh? Should we do the diffuse nebula? Because we haven't seen one of those tonight. What do you guys think? Let's look at it in, oh my goodness. We have to go see this, right? Let's go there. We just voted. <laughs> um, Nebula, 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 Mike says, okay, thanks for backing me up. <laughs> Let's go see that Nebula. That's an amazing Nebula, isn't it? Ricky says, diffuse Nebula. Boy, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get this, but it is a beautiful Nebula, isn't it? Okay. Um, it's already there. I need to get busy and put these names in, don't I? 
So this is NGC 2170. NGC 2170. NGC, and this is Secret Deep 29. And it's a diffuse nebula in a diffuse nebula in mono, is it series? Mono series? Mono series? How do you say that? Monoceros? <laughs> Monoceros. Monocero. Monoceros. Sounds like a rhinoceros. Monoceros. Monoceros, yeah. It's going to pop in here in a second. Do our little display histogram restretch. Well, I wonder if we're close to the moon. A rhinoceros with no horn. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's go look and see how close we are to the moon. Back to Stellarium we go. The incognito astronomer, I always thought it was pronounced Rhinoceros, LOL. Okay, we're going to go with Monoceros. By the way, the incognito astronomer, I've watched your videos before. Thank you for stopping by. Let's see where we are here. We're pointed southeast. I don't think the moon is... Ah, uh, the moon's just barely on the horizon, so it would still, it would still be illuminating a little bit, but not that much. And the southeast is a favorable sky, and we're up 36 degrees here. So this is right over the building I'm in. <laughs> it's right over the building. By the way, see, you can make out the observatory, and there's my truck. I always park my truck right there, and it's there tonight. That's exactly where it's parked. So if the telescope could see a wider view, it would be looking out over the wall, over my truck, over this building that I'm in, and then to Monoceros. And Monoceros is right here. I wonder what kind of shape Monoceros is supposed to have. Oh, it's a unicorn. So I guess the uh, those are the two legs, and then so these are the two pair of legs, and this is the horn. How about that? You were one of the YouTubers that got me started making videos. No way! That's amazing, Incognito Astronomer. Well, I've visited you now, so turn around is fair game. <laughs> uh, so here's the part we're looking at. That's a very large area. I wonder if this area is 2149. NGC 21, no, this is 2149. I wonder where 2170 is. Let's look for NGC 2170. Oh, right there. Now let's look for NGC 2149. So that's 2170. Hmm. 
NGC 2149. Oh my goodness, it's far away. Okay, let's go back to 2170. 2170, it saves your most recent finds there. So this is 2170. No, this is, is that what we said? Is this 2170? Oh, so that must be that. Is that right? Let's do um, image annotation here. Yeah, 2170. By the way, there's NGC 2167 up here. But that's 2170. We're at uh, four minutes of integration. Let's, let's don't make it quite as dark of a night sky. And let's bring up our mids a little bit. By the way, did we do this reset here? We must have. Boy, we're not bringing in quite all that other material yet, are we? With just five minutes of integration. This reminds me of the kind of nebula that you might see around a star in the, um, like M45, the Pleiades. Look at this star. There's even a little nebulosity around it. Let's go back to Solarium. Yeah, that's what we're looking at here is nebulosity around different star shapes. So that must be NGC 2182 there. This is 2182. So we saw this nebulosity before we noted it in Stellarium. So it is fun to be able to do those kind of live observations. Right? Mr. Nother, nebulas are Ross's best friends. <laughs> That's a good idea, Mr. Nother. Mike, a rhinoceros with no horn. The uh, uh, Mr. Nother, and I, oh, you got the CM70. That's, of course, the same one we have, except we have the G, which is worthless. The G is a, is a worthless add-on, if you ask me. But we do use it sometimes for, the G stands for guide scope. It does come with a built-in guide scope, but I mean, we've used it just for experimenting. Needed something carry with my setup that's 20 kilograms. It's a 10 inch Rochien Chrétien, rich, rich Chrétien. Better than my previous EQ6, which was working at its limit, I bet. Boy, I bet you do great work with that 10 inch RC. We can't wait to see your videos. I hope you'll get to the point that you do videos for us, Mr. Another. Well, I don't know how long it's going to take to be able to make this nebulosity show up that we see in Stellarium. <clears throat> the nebulosity that's surrounding all these stars. This is a beautiful image here, isn't it? I mean, it could take us 20 minutes or it could take 30 minutes or longer. I haven't seen very many things that take longer than 20 or 30 minutes, but let's play with our, let's do another, well, our live stretch is actually pretty good. Let's, let's see if we can lighten up this. Oh, you know what? I was imagining that that was moonlight, but it's not. It's the nebula, maybe. Maybe, no, nah, I think it's the moonlight reflecting in our, in our rasa. I don't have enough confidence. Let's go back here and let's look. You know, it could be, it could be real dark shark nebula. Is this the dark shark? Because I remember once before trying to do the dark shark, and it took forever. 
Uh, you're maybe you're remembering the Dark Shark Nebula, Ricky. That took. Yeah, that's what you're doing. You're remembering the Dark Shark Nebula at night. It took a very long exposure. Ricky, you have a good memory. I'm just west of a city, so the east is a glow dome at times. The west is clear. Let's look here and what, see what he says. Break down the Orion Monoceros complex into its smaller components. An ex excellent laboratory for studying the interaction between massive stars and the interstellar medium. Over the course of the last tw 12 million years, the molecular clouds in the region have been shaped, compressed, and disrupted by the powerful ionizing radiation, stellar winds, and supernova explosions of the young, massive stars in the Orion OB Association. Oh good, Mr. Another, we'll have to catch you on Twitch. Three giant molecular clouds. Monoceros R2 is the one to which uh, NGC 2170 belongs. Wow, supernova explosions. There is a lot written about this. 2149 nearby. Oh, it's in German. That's okay. Please don't be sorry. We would love to hear you in German. Uh, fainter shell, the illusion of fanning. Tells you how to find it. So he's basically helping you find 2149 and 2170. So this is the 2170 Angel Nebula. You can see the angel wings. Let's see what we are here now in our boy. Lots of nebulosity, but in, in 10 minutes. Oh, look, now we're starting to pick up some of it. Look at all of this nebulosity now around these partner stars. That's beautiful, isn't it? I wish we could turn the background down a little bit and still see it. Well, we are starting to see it. This deserves more time. I'm just going to do an observation here and say, this faint nebula deserves a lot more time than we gave it. After 11 minutes, we could make out the gas clouds um, surrounding the stars themselves. But the angel wings were still very diffuse. Huh. Maybe that's why they call it a diffuse nebula, right? Ha ha. Um, third cloud in the Orion Monoceros complex. So that's 2170. Let's do a save exactly a scene. And let's also do a crop snapshot of this central region. So that's maybe right here. 
because it really is cool. It's like the Pleiades, isn't it? Very same effect. Except those are blue and these are reddish. So this is NGC 21C. 2170 um, after 13 minutes 41 frames on 2022 1130 cropped Dean I'll be watching for your streams thanks for mentioning this for another nice and it reminds me of the flame nebula yeah I just might do that uh, let's go catch the 2149 real quick because they're companions. Twenty one forty nine. Very close. Very little scope movement. Scope is almost settled. This will be 2149. There we go. This is secret deep 28. <clears throat> and it's um, NGC. 2149, another diffuse nebula in Monoceros. Monoceros. Okay, so it's plate solving there. <clears throat> Tomorrow night, we're going to go back to the, what did we say, the Caldwell objects, I think? And we haven't been in the Caldwell Objects for some time. Maybe it was June or July, the last time we were there. You know how you kind of have to wait till the sky shifts in the seasons before you get uh, a collection of new objects enough to see. So we've now waited long enough and uh, we'll be able to go back to the Caldwell list and be able to catch Another batch, again, assuming it's still clear tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night's uh, live stream, be sure to notice, is a little bit earlier. Um, okay, so there's the display histogram stretch now. And I've often wondered, you see how this um, generates a rather donut looking shape. So the first reason, the first thing I did to try to work on that was I completely covered the camera in um, black felt. So you see how here the camera still is red anodized aluminum. Well, now that's all covered in black felt. So that's the first thing I did to try to get away from this donut. Then the next thing I did was um, a good set of um, flats. And mm -hmm. I wonder if the wrong flat is there. So let's reset it on the correct flat and then let's clear the live stock and restart. I'm curious as to whether or not with a good set of flats yes Dean streaming tomorrow night as well. Stu yeah more meteor storm live streams that's what, <laughs> yeah that's right that's what we need to grow. How about a geminid live stream? <laughs> Well, we could try that. You notice there's not as much pronounced donut now. So 
I do think the flat is helping a little bit. But nevertheless, not perfect. Another thing that I want to try to work on in time is maybe a little better back focus adjustment. And that's a kind of a, a work in progress with this Rasa 11. The, the permitted zone of, of focus <clears throat> is smaller than a human hair. And what I do in my enthusiasm, I, I get the back focus set in the middle of that human hair with the best I can. And then I do another few months of observing. And then I go back <clears throat> and get the back focus adjusted a little better. And then I do some more observing. So I think that might be a little bit of the problem as well. By the way, this is a cool little asterism of stars up here. Several little trails that look like, I don't know, maybe bed, bed bugs were biting the sky and they, they traveled in a, <laughs> a trail. Let's go over to Stellarium and look at this 2149. Well, look, it has no nebulosity at all. A reflection nebula, but nothing recorded in Stellarium at all. Well, that's a bummer, isn't it? Your donut may be due to the red lights. Hmm. As I'm thinking, we ought to check that theory. We ought to check out that theory for sure. So we're going to end this live stream, the regularly scheduled live stream, at 1230. But I'm actually going to walk out of the observatory and turn off the lights. Um, so. Oh, we're starting to see some reflection here. So keep in mind, we're starting to see a picture that doesn't even exist in Stellarium. So we'll have to take our, our picture here and put it in Stellarium, won't we? I'm going to hold the shift key down while I move this black level threshold bar. And that lets us adjust this with a finer degree of control. I'm going to try to set it just so the moonlight and the light pollution aren't a factor, but yet still show that luminosity, the nebulosity around that star. Let's also go out to um, <clears throat> GC 2149 and see if there's a picture of this. There is. That's as close as it gets. We might be able to zoom in on it a little bit. So we've got uh, four stars in a, what do you call that? Trapezoid? And in between those four brighter stars is this higher degree of luminosity. And maybe that's a dark nebula there. OK, let's go back to our live view. Here are the four, sto four stars in that trapezoid. So this is going to be our nebulosity, and that's going to be our dark nebula. Look at that little tiny star right there, even. I'm loving this after just five minutes. Back to the 
whatever view this is. Look how you can see those tiny stars. I think that's the one we were seeing. Wonder who made this? How do we go back? It's, I'm sorry to blind you like that. I'm so sorry. It's, um, Ces images sont de capture de crâne de la région de l'objet astronome. This is the images of the captured screen of the region of the astronomical object for the program Aladdin Light that I use to capture this. Uh, but I don't think he tells how long he is. Maybe up here. I don't see the length here anywhere, the rascal. I don't see it. Uh, let's go back to the live view. It's beautiful. Like a keystone shape, right? Mr. Another Stellarum is missing a picture of that object. Looks like an upside down coat hanger asterism to the left of that. I wonder if it is the coat hanger. Were you looking at Stellarium? Something like this? Oh, I think you're right. That does look like, do you think it's the coat hanger? There at the top, goes down, and there it comes over and up. Let's go to the coat hanger asterism. Nope, it isn't. <laughs> it's not the one that's called by the name, but I think you're right. It, it is a, another version of it. Um, here is the live view again, and you can see we're picking up a lot more nebulosity now. And we're also starting to see that dark nebula Okay, well, I know our time is up for our two-hour normal, uh, but I am going to say, if you have to go, please go. I'm going to go ahead and record walking out and turning off those red lights. You'll see the red lights go off in this scope cam live view. Uh, my, my Bluetooth mic will have dropped out long before that. But if you would like to stay on, the Dark Nebula is intriguing, right, Dean? If you would like to stay on and just watch those lights go off, then we'll, we'll, we'll try not to abuse, the, abuse your kindness and we'll check as Ray's theory about that, um, about that, may, are the red lights causing the donuts? So here we go. I'm going to head out to the observatory. It, it's... It's too far away for the Bluetooth mic to work. So if you have to go right now, we are so sorry to see you go. We understand. But we are going to run out and turn those off. Here we go. This Bluetooth mic starts to die out here somewhere. Um, even before I get... So I uh, forgot my headlamp and I'll need the headlamp because once I turn out the lights I won't be able to get out of the observatory without uh, running into something so here we go
Well, you know, it's work time is... Beautiful Orion up there high in the sky now. It's definitely winter time because Orion has made it back and he is high up there. Okay, I'm eager to see if you could see me in the observatory. <clears throat> oh, it's pretty, pretty black out there now, isn't it? Wow, it's kind of like a dark green. And what, what the camera's picking up there is just the dark green of the um, light pollution. The moon has already set. I'm gonna go to that camera um, let's see, where is that camera? Here it is. I'm going to go to that camera and I'm just curious as to whether or not I can Why is it not letting me configure the video? not letting me configure the video for some reason. I was wondering if I could dial up the video some more, but I think I already have it pretty wide open. <clears throat> All right, let me see what you guys said. Um, can you bring up mid some more? I'll be standing by. Out of Bluetooth range. Stu, I saw him lurking. I want to see if the donut goes away. Mr. Another put a donut in for us. Uh, yeah, Ryan is looking awesome. We should look at M42. Yep, we could see you out there. Now one can see how being the setup is. <laughs> um, so another, put in another donut. M42 is a great position here at South Florida at the moment. Yep, prime viewing. Let's go out and on a bang. Okay. Oh, there's where we're... I see where we can configure the, uh, the video now. Okay, it was on another screen. Okay, let me try that one more time. Um, so there's that. Well, there is a video amp. Let's try that. Look at that. You know, that's actually not bad, is it? It's, you know, the bottom line is 
as long as we have this light pollution, we don't even need those red lights. We can still see the scope and it's pitch black out there. Now, what is that light over there on the wall? That's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I know what that is. That's the reflection of the red lamp on the back of the uh, automatic, the, the motorized focuser, the, the Celestron motorized focuser. That's amazing that that red light shows up that much. So we can turn this gain up all the way to there. It's basically night vision, isn't it? Let's bump up the sharpness a little. Bam. Who needs those red lights? Mike says, I can see this go fine. You don't need the red lights. <laughs> Mr. Another, time for second coffee. A seven watt bulb works. Okay. All right. Well, uh, back at our screen, let's save. Let's bring up the mids here. And take our shot of this and then let's um, <clears throat> I'll tell you what let's do let's just reset <clears throat> the livestock because we pretty much know what it looked like before let's go back out to the ugly auto view it's going to pop into view in two seconds nope still there so that's a view without the red lights on and i think it's just a case of you know i've got the mids turned up so high that it's basically pulling out the slightest little sliver of bad, bad back focus on the Ross 11. It just pulls it out a little too much when we bump up those mids. So see right there, you have all the beautiful starlight you can find, but without that donut. Anyway. Oh, a new scope coming. No observing. <laughs> uh, not bad even without additional lights. Yeah, Stu is saying, oh, he was hoping that would get rid of it. Okay, let's, let's do um, just for four minutes. Let's do go to, um, Orion, quickly, we're going to just say here, um, we could see the diffuse nebula in a fan shape after just um, five minutes. That was on 2149. Now let's go to... M42. And to get there, we'll um, just use Stellarium. Because we have Stellarium set up with the scope as well. So this is looking south over the top of the edge of the observatory and the truck and the building where I'm sitting. And that's good framing. 
So now we should be able to go, um, remind me how we do this. Uh, is it control zero? I haven't done this in a while. Where is the scope? Oh, there it is. So we'll be able to tell if control zero works. Uh-huh. Slew the telescope to coordinates. Current object. Slew. Yeah, that worked. Next thing to try is to block out Louisville. <laughs> I like that, Stu. That's awesome. You shouldn't park your truck near the dome. Heat can hurt the scene. Tonight, we've got our camera cooled. We've got the truck cooled. It's a very cold night. <laughs> you know, it's probably like um, 30 feet away. I don't know, 20 feet away, something like that. All right. Let's see what this looks like now. There you go. Has the mount settled? Yes. We didn't have to plate solve this, right? You can see we were right on. And that's with a, what is it, three seconds at, it is a, it is a gain of 400, but it's just a three second shot. I am just so excited about focal ratio 2.2 scopes. Okay, we're doing a little correction here, but it wasn't that big of a deal because we just used the approximation in Stellarium to, to send it. But nevertheless, we did correct. Okay, so as soon as this settles, it'll start live stacking on its own now. I guess we'll save this set of observations. And I have a thing called for Deep Sky Planner. I typically go to something called um, Observe Next. And I'll just add here. Edit plan, and I'll say add. And the object we want to add is M42. And that'll let us do an observation of this. Wow, can you believe that? Amazing satellite photobombing. Let's clear this and shoot that one more time, just so we get rid of that satellite. Um, observation. We haven't observed this since January 11th, so it's high time to go back to M42. Another satellite. Let's clear that again. <laughs> Must have been one of those um, crazy, um, what are those called? They're traveling batches. What in the world? Another satellite. Starlink, is that what they're called? Uh, that is ridiculous of how fast Ross is. My only scope is a Maksutov class at 12.1 focal ratio. Imaging M42 took forever. Stu says, thanks, Doug. Awesome that you're so willing for viewer suggestions. Azray, I just did one of Orion last night. Lots of 15 second subs at a 9.25 edge HD came out nice. But I bet that 9.25 edge HD is F10, right? Dean, thank you for thanking. Uh, the donut 
seems not to be symmetrical. Maybe your collimation. Yeah, it could be that. Mike, thanks for a fun evening, Mr. Another. Beautiful M42. Starlink. Another one. <laughs> That's crazy. One shot EAA. Had a blast watching Road Dog. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to wrap this uh, live stream up. Thank you so very much for being here. This is M42, the Orion Nebula. And over here is the, what? what is that? The running, running, what is that? The running man, what do we call that? Uh, you guys know that better than I do. The, is it M, this one over here, is it M110 or something? I don't know. It'll take a minute to pass, I bet you're right. Demarin's, Demarin's Nebula. No, that's not it. Uh, this, maybe. The Lost Jewel of Orion, no. What is that? This? This, I bet. Running Man, yeah, Ricky, thanks. Running Man over here. Good night, everybody. God bless. Thanks again for being a part of this. If you like this kind of content, I hope you'll hit subscribe. And if it was, if you like it, you could do thumbs up. Uh, that'll get it up in the live, in the search results of everybody else. We would appreciate that. And it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, don't forget to check us out at emeraldhillskies.com. And there you can sign up for the email list so you can be notified via email. But when you subscribe, you'll be notified via YouTube either way, if you have a membership at YouTube. Um, God bless you guys. Thanks to the Lord for making all these beautiful objects. And we'll see you in the next one, hopefully tomorrow night. Hope to see you then. Good night. And God bless.